Cheng Li and the Silk Road Caravan, Chapter 8 Cheng Li lay in the sand with muscles that refused to move, until gradually he recovered some of his strength and recalled what Master had said on that day they had first met. Trouble we will surely have. Well, here it was. Cheng Li cleaned himself up as best he could and went back to the caravan, feeling only slightly sorry for himself. As he looked at the scene before him, everything seemed brown. The sandstorm had left a layer of brown dust over people, camels, packs, clothes, everything, even thoughts. Can thoughts be brown? he wondered. They felt brown. Two of the princess's carts lay in ruins. Ama was gone. Mei Ling sat by the wreckage, silently looking at the ground. Sudarshana had her own eyes tightly closed. She hugged the princess, it seemed to Cheng Li, to keep them both from falling over. He looked for Dakshesh and found him climbing over the broken cart to get into the kitchen cart. It was not damaged, and inside he found the cook cowering behind the smashed pots. He pulled the cook out from hiding, and together they hunted for anything they could find to wrap around the shivering, silent princess. Master Fong and Uncle Tao left the wounded and picked their way over the debris to confer quietly with the royal soldiers. Then they called the five young people together. This is a tragedy, Master Fong said, for you, princess for all of us. We will have to delay our journey until the men and beasts heal. We must all be strong to go north across the empty land. It will take about three weeks to reach the town of Hami, and the sun gets hotter every day. The hotter the sun, the slower we are forced to walk. He looked around at the men who had gathered nearby, and then turned back to the princess. The healthy fellows will repair the wagons. The dowry cart, I fear, is beyond repair. At any rate, he shrugged, it now holds nothing but air. He looked at the heap of useless wreckage and rubbed his face, making the old scar shine in the fading light. They even took the donkey. Abdul, coming up to the group, shook his fist at the cloud of dust on the horizon. Those fools think every caravan is their own personal supply center! Cheng Li listened and felt his own frustration grow. We can't replace what's been stolen. Let's just move on. I want to get going. This wind that brought the sandstorm is the same wind that pulled me from Chang'an. I'm sure of it. It wants me to keep moving toward my father. In the next town or the next, I know I will find someone who knew my father. Your time will come, said Master Fong. But now, the master cocked his head toward fourth brother and Chang Li, we all have much work to do. You will work together to care for the princess, clean up the carts, find a place for her to sleep. I can't, began Chang Li, nodding his head toward fourth brother. Oh, master, fourth brother interrupted, little brother and I make a good team. When did you change my name? yelled Cheng Li in his mind. We have long practice working together, Master, Fourth Brother continued. We will do as you say. He grinned and leaned down until his nose was just a few inches from Cheng Li's face. Cheng Li had never seen him quite this close before. The eyes brown as stone, the grin not friendly. The hands dropped at the wrists, floating, a reminder of the ghost that would haunt him if he ever chose to cross the older boy. It was a small gesture holding a world of threat. Ching Li's stomach muscles jerked into a knot. Thus, for the next two weeks, Uncle Tao kept busy brewing herbs and tonics for those with fevers, and Bori the Wolf applied the mysterious stinging ointments to the open wounds of both men and beasts. Gradually, people and animals healed and grew restless. Small caravans went ahead on their own, unwilling to wait for Master Fong. One chose to turn directly west and head straight out into the empty land of the Taklamakan the desert whose very name meant go in and you won't come out. They hoped the straight line across the desert would be a shortcut to Kashgar. You are fools! You will die! Bori shouted after the departing caravan. White dragon mounds block the way! You will find no water! None! He turned his back on them and muttered, Go if you must, but you won't live to come out. We, however, Master Fong ordered, will take the long route to the north, around the edge of the desert, stopping briefly in the town of Hami. After that, we will turn west along the base of the Tian Shan, Heavenly Mountains. That way we will meet with the occasional rivers that flow from snow-capped peaks and bring water to each oasis. It will take us weeks to walk between rivers, Ching Li grumbled. But eventually each river does appear, Master Fong said, and with it farms, food, water, and the towns where you can ask about your father. Master Fong also grew more restless with each passing day, fretting as the summer heat grew intense. To survive the heat, he said. We will sleep during the day and walk by moonlight. Prepare. We move out at sundown. And then the new pattern set in. Night and day were reversed. At night, the camel drivers roped themselves to their string of ten animals, and the animals each to the next, for if separated in the black of night, 
the nearby sand dunes became like living dragons. They reared black against each other with a sameness that could lead on any lone wanderer to a shadowy and confusing death. Thus the nights went by, lonely and tedious, with softly jangling camel bells the only sound in the huge enveloping silence. Cheng Li took turns with fourth brother caring for the animals and protecting the princess. When he worked alone, he could often hear her and the servants talking softly in the shadowy distance. Princess and her girl servant had both changed into rough brown tunics and pants, better suited to walking the sandy desert. Mei Ling grows strong, Cheng Li thought. She walks more, complains less. The desert changes her. They'd been walking now for some ten or twelve weeks. He'd lost count. But it was the end of the sixth month, and it was summer instead of spring. Bori said they were halfway to Kashgar. Halfway, thought Cheng Li, only halfway. A thousand miles behind, a thousand more in front. They survived because the nights were cool, but within an hour of sunrise the heat soared so that even breathing became difficult. Hot air seared Cheng Li's nose, dust clogged his throat. Each man found a way to build shade with makeshift tents or a blanket pulled over a camel and into the sand, and in their spot of shade they tried to sleep. In such a way the caravan moved north for twenty more days, until across the brown wasteland he could see the tower signaling the gate to Hami. There was a single roof on that tower, Cheng Li noticed, the sign of a smaller town. As they drew near, the green trees and fields appeared, then the river, and finally the town of Hami rising above the flat line of the desert. Again, the road followed the narrow strip of irrigated land, lush and green and enticing, with the promise of melons, large oblong melons with pale yellow skin and fruit so crisp and fragrant that hundreds were sent each year down to Chang'an for the emperor. And the emperor loved them so much that he named them after the town. The Hami Melon. Cheng Li's mouth watered just thinking of them, but sadly, it was too early in the year to eat them. Master Fong bought preserved ones and promised them fresh ones by the time they reached the next town. Cheng Li stopped thinking about food as the dirt road became crowded and he had to force the camels to walk along the edge. Wooden ox carts rumbled slowly along as farmers took newly picked vegetables to the city markets. Dogs barked, children ran, and friends called out to each other as they passed. After the long weeks of the silent desert, Cheng Li's spirits rose, and hope rushed into his chest. He felt his heart beat faster. Finally, he'd have a chance to ask about his father. Here in this town, surely someone would know of him. As the caravan stopped and settled for the day, Cheng Li hunted for Master Fong to ask permission to go into town. Mei Ling's call interrupted him. Skinny one, she called. I am tired of walking in the dust of your camels. If I am to be a nomad bride, I must learn to ride a horse. You will teach me. Not me. I can't. You can't, but I order you. Remember, I can also order you separated from your head. Cheng Li jumped, startled at the memory. He turned to flee, but her eyes twinkled and a smile lit up her face. But, Cheng Li said, trying to escape her demanding voice, truly I can't. I, I must work. Then under his breath he added, I don't know how to ride a horse anyway. What? You are a master animal driver? You are at ease with both camels and donkeys. I am useless with horses. I do not understand their spirits. They're too large and too strong, and... He hesitated. If I sit on one, I'm too far from the ground. He looked at the ground, hoping the horse-riding soldiers were too far away to hear. He felt for the very first time like the skinny little one they all called him. And besides, he said as he looked up again, I won't be here. I must go to the town. I must find out if anyone remembers my father. Just then, fourth brother passed by on his way to breakfast. Princess, I know how to ride a horse. I can help you. He grinned at Chen Li. Go, take care of your work. I'll take care of the princess. His grin turned into a sneer as his lip curled scornfully. Heat flashed across Cheng Li's face. He reached out to stop Mei Ling from following fourth brother, but quickly dropped his hand. He watched them turn to ask the soldier for the loan of a horse. Helpless, he turned toward the town. Wait, Dakshesh called out. I have no love of horses. May I go with you? You shouldn't go alone into a strange new town. You would join me? It will be good to have a companion. I'd welcome your company. Two are always stronger than one. Heading toward the town, they did their best to become presentable, brushing dust off their brown tunics and stamping their feet to clean their trousers. They fell in step with the crowd as they approached the mud-brick wall surrounding the city and passed through the arch that pierced through the massive brick platform that held the lookout tower. The gate stood open and two useless guards dozed in the shade of the wall. The boys walked along a street of hard-packed earth in a town that looked and smelled like all the others. Buildings like small mud-brick boxes open to the street with vendors sitting in the opening selling everything from bean soup to stringed instruments. 
Crowds push this way and that, making their way around stinking animal droppings and rotting garbage. Cheng Li's hopes began to fade. How in this huge and unknown city, with only this one day to search, could he possibly find anyone who might know about his father? He couldn't ask just anybody, for most people stayed far away from officials, fearing to be thrown into jail for something they didn't do, or forced to pay a tax for something they didn't own. Soldiers might know, a magistrate might know, but where to find them, he wondered. That is, until they looked down a side road and saw just ahead an ornately carved lattice gate, protected by uniformed guards standing stiffly with iron trident spears at their sides. Suspecting a magistrate's office, the boys approached. The guards snapped their spears closed in an X across the walkway and glared at the boys. Filthy scum, be gone, ordered the guard. Most honored warrior, the desert dust makes all men equal. Cheng Li flinched at using such an honorific language to lowly guards, but it seemed the only way to get past them. He thought of fourth brother and tried to sound like him. I am nobody, but my family name is Chow, and my father was Inspector Chow Cheng Wan. He said it a bit too loudly, he knew, but he hoped that might impress the guards. My father disappeared many years ago. I wish to talk with anyone who may know of him. The guards relaxed their rigid stance in surprise, glancing quickly at each other. Well, this is a unique story. Inspector Chow, huh? Who do you want to talk to? I don't really know. I know only that I must talk to someone who is important enough to know an Imperial Inspector and has been here a long time. My father disappeared thirteen years ago. People come, people go, the guard said disinterestedly. Hey, you with the crooked nose, the second guard called to a passing worker. Take these boys to the barracks and see if anyone out there has ever heard of Inspector Chow Cheng Wan. Crooked Nose slowed his pace and grumbled under his breath. He glowered at the boys and shuffled in front of them, leading them through the main courtyard, past the entrance to the magistrate's office, and back through three smaller yards until they came to the barracks, crowded with off-duty soldiers, whiling away their time. Against one wall leaned the huge bows, carefully stocked arrows, and iron chariot spears that were twice as long as Cheng Li was tall. No, no, he called out. Not here. I, I want to talk to the magistrate. Start here, Crooked Nose barked. These are the fellows who hear things. They know things. He aimed a swift kick at one sleeping man. Wake up, lazy boots. Your wondrous knowledge of the world is needed. With a laugh, he turned and left the two boys standing there, waiting. When lazy boots stretched himself half awake, Cheng Li repeated the story. Inspector Chow? Haven't seen him in years. Where is he these days? You knew him? Really? He was killed by bandits. I I'm his son, but I never knew him. That is why I'm here, looking for someone who can tell me about him. Everybody knew him. Everybody. Great man. Good man. Lazy Boots rambled, his voice still sleep-slurred. Tall one. Stood out in every crowd. Loved horses. Fantastic with horses. Lazy Boots yawned and got up off his mat. Inspector Chow was tough. He never took a bribe, always inspected the caravans carefully, but everyone knew he would rather be out riding horses. The man scratched his head and looked more closely at Cheng Li. Who did you say you are? His son? Then you must know where he is. How's he doing? He's dead. Kidnapped, repeated Cheng Li in frustration. I'm trying to learn about him. What was he like? Don't you remember anything else? Where did you see him last? But Lazy Boots had flopped back down on the floor, snoring loudly. Cheng Li looked around the room. He rubbed the piece of jade in its pouch and then yelled out to the entire room, Does anyone here remember my father? Family name is Chow. Personal name, Chang Wan. Inspector Chow Chang Wan. Have you even heard of him? Men glanced up at him, but no one moved and no one answered. Cheng Li tried again. Can I go see the magistrate? Maybe he knows. Lazy Boots choked on a snore and pulled himself up on one elbow. Go away, boy. Magistrate is new here. He knows nothing about anything. Cheng Li shrugged and poked Duck Shesh in the ribs. It's no use. Let's go. That evening, as the caravan workers busied themselves with their chores, preparing for the next march, Cheng Li glanced up to see Fourth Brother approaching along the line of shadows. He had been working on the princess's cart, and as Cheng Li watched him, the older boy stooped to pick up something from the sand. As Fourth Brother crept by, the thing in his hand, a comb, caught the light from the setting sun. Cheng Li squinted his eyes to make sure he had seen correctly. The comb in Fourth Brother's hand seemed unusual, with delicate teeth held in the half-circle of ivory and a handle hammered in gold, barely visible in the fading light. When Fourth Brother noticed Cheng Li watching, the comb quickly disappeared into his pouch. Cheng Li shrugged. It was none of his business. 
and turned his thoughts back to his camels.